It looks as though uh, with the spread of enlightenment, the spread of literacy, the spread of scientific knowledge, that more and more people are um, coming to think, along with Dan Dennett, that they might be atheists. And that's good news. It's supported by a lot of empirical data, for example, from Pew polling results in the United States, which we think of as a country, a sort of God-besotted country, uh, where increasingly, especially among under 35s, larger and larger proportions of the population are saying that they have no religious affiliation or commitment. But it's important to look back across the landscape of history a bit to understand what the present phenomenon is uh, in this discussion, sometimes rather bad-tempered discussion between um, people who uh, retain a religious commitment and those of us who don't. To look back, uh, for example, at the 16th century after the Reformation, when the Roman Catholic Church, which had been the church in the West, uh, lost a great deal of influence and control over great swathes of Europe, and it fought back very bitterly. Same thing happened in the 19th century after Darwin and after the uh, movements in the second half of the 19th century stemming from the scholarship, especially in Germany, but also in the UK, questioning the historicity of the Bible and showing that the Bible of religion, at any rate, was a document made by many people, uh, many uh, texts over a very long period of time, and that there were spurious interpolations in it. And these were anxious times for people of faith, and they did the same thing as they did in the 16th and 17th century, and that is they, they fought back, much as a, a cornered animal might do. And I think we're witnessing the same phenomenon now. After what we refer to as 9-11, there's been a polarization, quite a dramatic one, in the debate over religion and its place in the public square. And uh, a, a lot of people who have a kind of, have had a residual religious faith, have uh, come out much more openly and strongly in support of their faith. And a lot of people who didn't care about religion very much and didn't really bother to take part in these discussions realized that they had a commitment on the other side of the argument, the non-religious side of the argument, and felt that they had to step up too and be part of the discussion about what we are to do about the effect, the influence, the place of religion in our public policy discussions, in our education, uh, its effect on science, and uh, in particular, the effect that it has on individual lives, individual lives of, of women, of gays, um, of minorities in countries where religious zealotry is a major influence. And so the trend that we've seen, especially in more advanced um, economies in the world over the last couple of centuries, and in particular the dramatic change to the historical rhythm introduced by the Enlightenment of the 18th century, which uh, earlier on Peter Singer was talking about referring to Steve Pinker's book, where that development to greater peace and cooperation among people uh, became more pronounced as a result of the 18th century Enlightenment. That trend is a good and a positive trend, and it's one that we, on this side of the debate, uh, need to capitalize on. So we asked the question, what next for atheism? What should people, with our view of things, be thinking about doing to try to make sure that this, well, the healthy trend continues, even though, of course, it's going to be uh, a work of long breath, as the French say, there would be many um, decades, perhaps even centuries, before finally humanity is liberated from its, its past, the deep roots in ignorance and superstition, which uh, um, we now think of as the established religions. I think there are three areas we need to focus on. One is the question of the metaphysical debate, the debate about the nature of the universe that we occupy. Uh, of course, Physics and cosmology tells us a very great deal about that, and Lawrence is going to tell you about that in a little while. But the metaphysical aspect of it is a debate about whether or not, in addition to all the um, forces and uh, entities described by, by physics, there is something else. Are there supernatural agencies? Are there gods and goddesses, angels and archangels? That discussion, the metaphysical discussion, is one which still needs to be pursued we still have to have a conversation with people who want to believe that there are agencies of that kind. And that's a discussion about rationality, about evidence, about our understanding 
and the way that we achieve further understanding about the nature of the universe. The second debate is a debate about secularism. It's a debate about just where religious organizations, the religious voice, um, is positioned in the public debate and its influence on government policy and its place in education. And the third, and, and in some ways, perhaps the most important one, because it is the one which might most quickly help people who are wavering in their views about religion or who um, would like to be able to uh, free themselves from, from religion, is the debate about the ethical, about our lives, about how we live them and make decisions about uh, what sort of communities we're going to construct and what the basis of our relationships with one another should be. And this is a very, very important one. This is why a lot of people who don't have a religious commitment um, commit themselves to a humanist view of the world. And by a humanist view, I, I don't mean anything very elaborate, just the view that our ethics, our attitude towards other people, and our sense of our responsibility to them should be premised on our best, most generous, most sympathetic understanding of human nature and uh, the human condition. So that's a point I'll come back to in a moment. The first point, the point about, about the metaphysical discussion, what kind of place is this universe and what does it contain? Well, I'm very diffident uh, and indeed reluctant to disagree with um, anything that Dan said a little while ago. Uh, when Dan suggested that what we should do is just slip in little atheistical comments like uh, um, Disney, Walt Disney was an atheist. By the way, I, I didn't know that, so that's, that's good to know. Uh, or um, some people still believe that there are gods and so on. That little remarks like that just dropped in would help people to get a kind of perspective, a sense of perspective on what they hear from other resources. But I have a little anxiety about that in the following way. And for very good evolutionary reasons, children are very gullible, very, cred very credulous. And the things that adults on whom they rely in their immediate circle say about the world are important to children. Fire burns, um, buses run over you, so you must be careful, you must do this, you mustn't do that. These are things that children have to believe. They have to be very, very accepting of what is offered to them on the authority of the adults in their circle in order for them to survive. So they are prepared to believe everything. They believe in fairies, they believe in the tooth fairy, for example, they believe in Father Christmas. I mean, I've been bringing up my, my youngest child as an atheist. My wife says to me, that means you'll probably you know, want to be a mother abbess when she's a teenager. But um, we, we learn the lesson from the religions that if you can indoctrinate them early enough, they will always revert to type later. So um, I've been bringing her up to, to, to say, to, never to use the word God, but always to use the phrase gods and goddesses. I also point out to you that when people use the, the word God with a capital G as if it were a name, as if it referred to something, that she should ask the people who do that to substitute the name Fred, because then it shows the vacuity of what they're saying. And who created the universe? Fred. So, and then you suddenly see that it's actually not explanatory at all. Or who says that you shouldn't lie or you should, should honour your mother and your father? Fred, says he. Well, once again, you, you see the vacuity of it. So I've always taught her to say gods and goddesses, and she said to me one day when she was about seven or eight, she said, I don't believe in gods and goddesses, but I do believe in the tooth fairy. And I said, well, that's actually pretty smart of you because there's much more empirical evidence for the tooth fairy than there is for God. <laughs> and I could leave it up to her to, to find out, as she did at the age of 10 or 11, uh, that there wasn't a tooth fairy and that there wasn't Father Christmas. And by, by the way, I mean, she's quite serious about Father Christmas. Uh, she came up to me about two Christmases ago, in fact, and said, uh, uh, don't tell uh, Mummy, but I, I know about Father Christmas. But don't tell her about it, because she likes to believe that I still believe that there is Father Christmas. So that was, that was a bit of nuanced thinking also. <laughs> but she is, she, she's an example of how children can can accept anything, can accept the fairy stories, can accept the legends, can accept the religious teachings of their community, can believe in the tooth fairy and in Father Christmas. But the one thing which retains powerful social reinforcement after they've given up their credulity in things like Father Christmas is religion. If you live in a Christian community, you're surrounded by churches, there are church services on the radio, there's Christmas, there's Easter, 
Uh, we talk about the Church of England, C of E, Christmas and Easter, that's what most, most people go for. But the, the fact that they still go for it is a reinforcement. And so children continue to think that there must be something serious behind it if uh, so many grown-ups uh, get dressed up like the Archbishop of Canterbury and, and appear on telly. The Father Christmas thing and the Tooth Fairy thing don't get reinforced in that way. And therefore, there is a job of work to be done. The job of work involves trying to get people, children especially, to think a bit critically about the sorts of things that people believe and why they believe them. This is a very, very familiar point. You want to, to demand of people that they be rational uh, in their beliefs. And what you mean by rational is that there should be a ratio, a proportion, between the grounds that they have for thinking something about the world, the beliefs that they hold, and those beliefs themselves. That if somebody makes a claim about how the world is, that they've got to come up with a robust case. And they should be open to having that case examined. And they should explain to you what would count as confuting or even refuting that case. And if they don't do that, if it's a matter of bare assertion or appeal to tradition or appeal to authority, that that can't be good enough. And so that's the, the job of work that we have to do on the metaphysical front. And it has to be done in a number of different ways, not just by addressing the claims made about the nature of the universe, that it was created by uh, a powerful agency um, designed on purpose to fulfill certain functions and so on. Not just that, but also by inviting people to think a little bit about the origins and the history of the religions. To look, for example, at how the religions have behaved in history and to ask whether that stands up to any kind of justifying case for them. It is written somewhere, I forget where, by their fruits ye shall know them. Well, indeed, look at their fruits. Look at how history is panned out under the government of religions. For almost all of human history, of recorded human history at any rate, um, there have been religious leaders, religious teachers, the influence of religious beliefs in society. And we can ask ourselves quite legitimately the question, uh, how has that been for humankind? Has it on the whole been a successful story? And that's something that we should challenge people to understand because it's been a very important feature of the way religions have survived, not only that they proselytize young children uh, and adults, parents teach their children the same beliefs that their own cultural tradition treasures, but also because they've obscured facts about the past and reinvented themselves in ways that make them more acceptable to, to any present time. For example, the Church of England in the 1920s, at one of its synods, uh, abandoned the doctrine of hell. Uh, we've seen, um, just in recent years, the, the Vatican uh, apologize for its persecution of Galileo. By the way, the anniversary of the trial of Galileo was just uh, two, day, two days ago, as you may, as you may know. Forgetfulness, amnesia about the past and about how the religions behaved in the past is, is very useful to them because they can present themselves now as being positive agencies in our societies, doing charitable work, encouraging people to be kind to one another. They complain bitterly, uh, apologists for religion, that atheists and secularists are aggressive and hostile to them in their criticisms of them. I always say when people talk about militant secularism, I always say, look, uh, you know, when, when you guys were in charge, you, you didn't used to argue with us, you just burnt us at the stake. Now what we're doing is we're, we're presenting you with some arguments and some challenging questions, and you complain. In fact, it was, um, it was, it was T.H. Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, T.H. Huxley, who in a letter to Darwin said, um, bishops are like... It's not, not a very kind remark, this, by the way, but perhaps nevertheless true. He said, bishops are like pigs. If you poke one, they all squeal. And this is what's been happening in the last, in the last 10 years. Criticism, criticism is received as a, an offense, as an affront, uh, and, and even rather reasonable people like um, Rowan Williams, Archbishop of Canterbury, use this phrase, militant secularism. And I've always been surprised by that. I've often wondered, for example, what a, a, a fundamentalist atheist is. Fundamentalist atheist. Well, well, what would a non-fundamentalist atheist be? That's somebody who believes that a, a part of a god exists, maybe. 
like, like a left foot or a buttock of a... Of a or, or that God exists on one day in the week, that's Sunday. That's actually what most Christians think, I think. So, I mean, you, you, it's, it's very difficult to accept these, these uh, charges of fundamentalism and milit militancy when, of course, uh, one look at the landscape of history shows us what militancy and fundamentalism really